I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Well, let me tell you, it's, it's uh, very good to be here and... Uh... I've, I wanted to be a place where I'd be able to explain my Scottish heritage and, uh, and to be explained, for example, when I, go back to, when I go back to New York, you know, they have all these, uh, all these uh, Italians. And they always want to come up to me. They want to hug me and stuff and kiss me. I thought, I'm a Scotsman. So I wanted to illustrate with my brother self, I want to show you a Scottish hug. Did you catch it? Did, did you see it? Yeah, there you go. It's, it's, it's a very... That's, that's how we show love for one another. Uh, <clears throat> I, I actually could show you pictures of my, uh, my Scottish ancestors uh, when they moved here in uh, 1889 from uh, Scotland, but I won't do that because we don't have enough time. But uh, uh, and, and exactly, exactly how many uh, kilts do you have, brother? Just one. I, I've got two, both, both made in Glasgow. Thank you very much. Okay. So anyway. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, uh, we won't we won't go any farther than that because I, I want to be able to get some refreshments. Okay, <laughs> it is good to be with you. I'm going to have to try to remind myself, quite honestly, to speak somewhat quietly and use the amplification. I have been lecturing since eight o'clock this morning uh, at uh, Cornerstone Seminary in Viejo, where I drive back this evening and lecture again starting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Uh, and I can already tell that uh, the voice is uh, getting rather gravelly and deep, so I'm going to have to try uh, to restrain my excitement. Uh, I do get excited about these things. I do not lecture on these things uh, because they are dry uh, topics to me. They are the very essence of life. And my hope, honestly, very briefly, is for those of you who are believers here this evening, my concern is that we as evangelicals fear the Muslim people. We fear them because most of what we know about Islam we have learned from Fox News. Now, nothing against Fox News. It's all about MSNBC. Oh, did I say that in Sacramento? Oh, I'm in trouble. <coughs> I better leave right now. Um, but um, the reality is that uh, if you fear someone, <coughs> it is very unlikely that you will open up your heart truly to them and share with them. Uh, or if you do so, it will be in a very perfunctory manner, in a, in a very distant manner. And unfortunately, uh, well, let me just ask, how many of you in this room, please not put your hand up if you've only read a part, have read all of the Quran? Okay, I see two hands. Uh, I, I saw the second hand. Um, did either one of you read it in Arabic? No. So from an Islamic perspective, no one in this room has read all of the Quran, uh, just from, so you understand uh, the Muslims do not believe that the Quran exists in any language but, uh, but Arabic. This is the most common uh, form. I was going to pass it around, but then I just realized it would never get around the room before we'd be done this evening. I normally pass it around so you can take a look at the Quran. Uh, the unfortunate part is that in a similar-sized audience of Muslims, if I asked how many of you have read the Bible, you'd have a very similar proportion of people who have actually read it. In other words, we're not talking to each other. And the, the sad thing is most Muslims would love to talk about their faith with you. And they'd love to hear from you about your faith as well. And so while most of us are beating our heads trying to get secularists to even talk to us about anything spiritual at all, there's an entire group of folks who would love to be talking about spiritual things with us. But because of fear, fear born out of either misinformation or ignorance, normally ignorance, that conversation rarely happens. And so this evening, I am not going to be able to disabuse you of all of that ignorance, to be perfectly honest with you. There's just not enough time. But what I will try to do is at least do an introduction, give you an idea of what some of the basic issues are. Maybe during the Q&A, we can dispel some of the other uh, myths and legends that are out there. But at least give you an idea of what the key issues are, the key barriers are in your presentation of the gospel to the Muslim people. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to uh, bring this message in, in some amazing places. Uh, in 2012, I got to debate in two different mosques. I debated uh, Imam Shabir Ali in the Toronto mosque. And then uh, four days after the Benghazi attack, I debated uh, in the East London mosque in London, England, the largest mosque, largest physical mosque in Europe. And so I've had some amazing opportunities, hope to have some more, hopefully 
We'll be debating at Trinity College Dublin uh, against Adnan Rashid next month. We're still working on things like that. Some amazing opportunities. I want to try to share some of those things with you. Let me try to introduce you to some of the important ideas uh, found in uh, Islam. I'm going to have to be brief. Please feel free to take notes. Um, but we're also recording this evening, and so you can go back and listen. Uh, a longer version of this presentation is probably on YouTube someplace because I've done some fairly lengthy versions of it. The five pillars of Islam begin with the Shahada. The Shahada. The Shahada is how you become a Muslim. We're going to look at someone becoming a Muslim, a group of people becoming Muslims uh, in just a moment. Uh, but the Shahada is, is saying in Arabic, La ilaha illallah wa Muhammadan Rasulullah, which means there is only one God worthy of worship, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. But you must say it in say it in Arabic to become a Muslim. How many here who are Christians made your profession of faith in either Hebrew or uh, Greek? Oh, no one, no one at all. Uh, this is one of the key differences between uh, Islam and Christianity. Arabic is central uh, to being able to understand uh, much of the Islamic conversation, even though only about 16 to 20 percent of all the world's Muslims are Arabs. Uh, many people think, well, Arab uh, Muslim. No, there are many Arab Christians, uh, and uh, the majority of the world's Muslims are not Arabic. Uh, that needs to be kept in mind uh, as well. But Islam is a religio-political system or a politico-religious system, depending on whether it is in the majority or the minority or exactly where it fits in that spectrum. You cannot separate out the Sharia from the issue of Islam at all. It's just not possible to do. And so the idea of having uh, a culture that comes along, the, the dress, uh, all the things that are associated with Sharia, that comes into uh, the, the equation when Islam becomes predominant in an area. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a few moments. The second of the five pillars is Salat, the prayers. In some nations, such as Indonesia, you don't even ask someone if they're a Muslim. You say, do you do the prayers? There are five daily prayers. They change depending upon the time of the year. Uh, the Fajr prayer in the morning, for example, in, uh, in uh, Arizona anyways, can be as early as 3.55 a.m. in the morning during the summers. Um, and uh, these are, are prayers that are done in Arabic. Uh, you may be thinking in your language, but you need to learn them in Arabic as you, uh, as you engage in the prayers. You have a psalm, the fasting in the month of Ramadan. Some of you may have heard of Ramadan. Uh, the first time I heard of Ramadan was when the Houston Rockets were playing in the NBA Finals. Uh, and their sender, Hakeem Olajuwon, uh, some of the games were during the day. And the Muslim will fast during the day, will not eat, and will not drink, including water, from the time the sun rises in the morning until it sets in the evening. And so there was actually speculation. How will Hakeem be in the fourth quarter when you can't drink? Uh, during that period of time because the game was during the daytime. Uh, that was when I first heard about uh, Ramadan. And uh, that is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. Please remember that the Muslims use a lunar calendar. And uh, therefore, the month of Ramadan keeps moving up 11 days in our solar calendar each year. And so right now, next year, it will be in July. Can you imagine what it is like to live in Saudi Arabia and fast the month of Ramadan where you cannot drink from the time the sun rises in the morning until it sets in the evening, and it's 125 degrees. Uh, it, is, it is an amazing, uh, amazing thing. Zakat is the giving of alms. Just in, in passing, it's 2.5% of anything you possess for more than a year. Uh, that depends on you know, what culture you're in and things like that, what it's used for. And finally, the Hajj is the pilgrimage. Every Muslim who is able to do so, healthy enough to do so, and financially can do so, is to make at least one trip to Mecca and Medina and to perform the Hajj. Ironically, as of now, as of just the past few years, it has been figured out that given the number of Muslims in the world and the number of Muslims that are allowed to perform Hajj in Saudi Arabia each year, this could no longer be fulfilled. Even if all the Muslims in the world wanted to, they couldn't do it anymore because there are so many Muslims, which is an interesting, interesting aspect. Now, just as there are all sorts of different mindsets amongst Christians. There are all sorts of different mindsets amongst Muslims as well. I want to give you some examples uh, in, from some of uh, my debates and first from a clip 
uh, my, uh, uh, this particular one I chose because it's an excellent ex uh, explanation of the Shahada. How many of you have ever seen someone becoming a Muslim? Anyone ever seen someone become a Muslim? Okay, not, not very many. I like this clip because there are so many similarities, eerie similarities to things we've seen in Christian churches, and yet there are fundamental differences. I also like this clip because, well, when I started really studying Islam a, a number of years ago, uh, I would be studying a certain person and I, was, I would say to my wife, hey, Cal, come over here and, and listen to what Zakhar Naik said. And she'd come over and Zakhar Naik has this very deep Indian accent. Or listen to Ahmed Didat, he's from South Africa. And she'd listen for a few seconds and go, I don't know what he's saying. This guy is from Brooklyn, New York. So he's nice and easy to understand. I also want to tell that story because my dear wife's twin sister is here this evening. I saw her sneaking in the back. So, hi, Shell. Nice to see you back there. <laughs> um, I could tell you some stories there, but we do not want to digress. So it is very easy to understand. It's about seven minutes long. This took place in Sydney, Australia, just a few years ago. In fact, I had the opportunity of uh, lecturing at Moore College a few years back, and some of the students in the world's missions class that I was uh, teaching uh, themselves had attended this particular event. It was about a three-day event. It was mainly a lecture against Christianity filled with all sorts of historical errors, saying the Council of Nicaea was in 354, it was 325, and uh, that at the Council of Nicaea they got rid of the Gospel of Barnabas, which was actually written about a thousand years later, and just all sorts of, of, of amazing errors. But here at the end, this man by the name of Khalid Yassin, in essence, gives an Islamic altar call. And so I would like you to listen to this, listen, watch, and compare, and then we will uh, talk about it a little bit afterwards. Can you stand for me quickly? Just stand for me. Come right here, please. transition or this transaction because this is what it is these are human beings that's making a transaction with God they're not making a transaction for us they're making a transaction with God and a transition in their lives so I want to make this easy for them we have a gift for them and we're going to give them this gift now the gift that we're giving to them is something that will help them on their way one, it's a copy of the Qur'an with the transliteration of the meanings. Secondly, it's a short, easy to read, authentic biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Thirdly, it is a set of seven books. a set of seven books that have in it lessons for new Muslims. Now, your acceptance of Islam is your acceptance of God, not your acceptance of me, or not your acceptance of these people, nor your acceptance of the political dynamics in the world, because it has nothing to do with that. It's just your acceptance of God. And this gift is to help you make that trans transition. I want you to say with me, the simple words, and these words are nothing more than what I have explained. There's no trick, no curve, and we don't have a pool in the back for you to dip in. <laughs> but let's say the words. Let's just go over the words called the Shahada, the bearing of witness. And I'll tell you what it is. Essentially, it is the saying of that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God, and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Saying that word, and then adding to it, I testify, or I declare, or I announce, 
that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God, and that I testify, or I declare, or I announce that Muhammad is the messenger of God, brings you all into the transition of Islam. From that point, it's your sincerity, it's your acts of worship, it is your commitment that will make the difference. Now, whatever you owe God of something you did that only you know and God knows after tonight, your board is clear. Because God is the forgiver of those that come back to him. But whatever you owe somebody, money, rent, a loan, you still owe that. <laughs> is that fair? Okay, please, just say after me the words, La, La, Ilaha, Illallah, Muhammad, Rasulullah, Ashhadu, An La, Ilaha, Illallah, Wa Ashhadu, Anna, Muhammadan, Abduhu, Abduhu, Wa Rasulu. Sallallahu Allahu alayhi wa sallam. Amin. Well, there you go. That's how you become a Muslim. Now, some things looked eerily familiar, didn't they? You have uh, a large group, you have people coming down front, you have the, uh, the, the people in the audience encouraging people to come down front, you have them being given gifts, maybe discipleship things, maybe the New Testament, sounds somewhat familiar. Um, you have instructions, you have them being led in a prayer, a lot of similar things, but there are also a lot of different things. As I mentioned, you have to say it in Arabic. And to be honest with you, those folks wouldn't have had a clue what he was leading them in. He could have been leading them to order a cheeseburger with pickles. You have no, they would have no way of knowing, except that they trusted him. But it has to be done in Arabic, just like the Quran only really exists in Arabic as well. And so you have something else. Did you notice the, the garb that he was wearing and that the men who were passing out the gifts were wearing? the same garb that was worn by Muhammad in the seventh century. And so there are fundamental differences. We avoided that kind of cultural baggage, shall we say, in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, where you have the Jerusalem Council, the decision that people do not have to become Jews before they become Christians. That is where that was avoided as far as you and I are concerned. Uh, but that did not happen in regards uh, to Islam. And so that is how a person becomes a Muslim. Now what wasn't explained, and I think maybe should be explained, is that Islamic law is, once you have said that, if you choose to leave Islam, the only penalty for that is death. Uh, there is no question about what Muhammad's teaching was in that particular subject, and if you just look, look at the laws of, of Islamic states, though there must be some people who would say there are no pure Islamic states today at all, the Hadith is very, very clear in indicating that the only penalty for a person who changes his religion, that is, leaves Islam, is death. Uh, that is why in most Islamic nations, proselytization is uh, completely illegal. Uh, Christians can live there, you just cannot cause a Muslim to become a Christian, and hence one of the great uh, difficulties for the Gospel. Now, there are all sorts of different understandings amongst the Muslim people. Here's an illustration from the debate I did back in 1999. This was really before I was studying Islam. I was simply defending the Christian faith here. Here is a man asking me a question who clearly isn't from around here, okay? He's from a, a nation, uh, a non-US nation, shall we say. Uh, and he is asking a question of me concerning a passage in the Bible, which he probably has never read himself. He's heard this. We'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. But here is the clip. And by the way, if you want to look down front, uh, you will see a uh, pretty blonde lady, that's my wife, and sitting next to her is about a 9 or 10 year old young lady. Uh, that's my daughter who just gave birth to my first grandchild a few weeks ago. So uh, here's, uh, here's uh, what happened in 1999. Yes, my question to the doctor, 
I heard you repeating many times and saying he's a creator about Jesus. Be some blessing be upon him because we Muslims believe in Jesus, the mighty prophet of God. I heard you many times you saying he's the creator of everything and all things. So I want you to explain to me if it's possible, if he's a creator of everything, when Jesus, be some blessing be upon him, was he walking by the fake tree with his companion, the fake tree with his companion, and he wants to eat some fake, and they told him, Master, the fake is not in season. So if he was God, how he don't know if he create the tree, how he know, how he, does, he doesn't know if what's in season or what not in season, if he create everything. Okay. okay. And if the fig was not in season and he's God, first of all, we don't accept God to be hungry, he wants to eat, but you, Christian, you said God chose to do so, so that's your faith. But I'm saying, even if he was God and fig is not in season, why he couldn't order the tree to bring fig? Okay, Isn't that you. God the word create everything? Okay, thank you. To the Dr. Word. He did so because the fig tree represented the people of Israel and he made the application to people of Israel look like they have fruit, but they do not. It was a clear application that he made. Secondly, he did eat food because the word became flesh. He became hungry. He became tired. Because as the New Testament, as it was written, clearly indicates, Jesus Christ was the God-man, the eternal Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. He was a true man, he ate food, he became tired, he slept, he grew, etc., etc. Christians have always believed that. Why? Because we believe all the New Testament teaches. But now, you might, I, I always like to watch the, uh, the audience when the feed to the argument is being presented. And uh, normally there's some folks sort of chuckling going, I've met Jehovah's Witnesses that did better than that. And, um, and, and it's true for us, you know, we're sort of like, Okay, Jesus isn't God because he didn't know when the season for figs was. If he was God, he could have just told the fig tree, bring forth figs. You know? And you, you sort of go, hey, that sort of misses the point. But when we chuckle at that, that's not a response. How would you respond to that? I did briefly. Obviously, I have to explain that the fig tree represented the people of Israel. And just yes, Jesus did know what the season of figs was. But the point was he's going into Jerusalem. He's going to be dealing with the Jewish leadership. They look like they have fruit. They don't have fruit. He curses the fig tree. He's not trying to make it bring forth uh, figs so he can eat because he's hungry or anything like that. And then I tried to deal a little bit with the, pre the presupposition of the Muslim that God cannot become man. That really is one of the key issues. But the thing to remember is this. The argument that man was making is a Quranic argument. We'll actually see it, at least we have, hopefully if we have time, we'll actually see it in the Quran itself. And so he's probably never talked to a Christian. He's probably never read that story in the Gospel of Mark. He simply heard this from someone else and unfortunately has probably never heard a meaningful response to it. I don't know that asking the question in a debate when I have very little time to, response is, uh, to respond is necessarily the best context either. But the point is you cannot assume uh, any level of knowledge whatsoever uh, on the part of the person you're talking to. This may be the best that they have heard. But that's one end of the spectrum. Now I'm going to jump to the other end of the spectrum. I'm cutting some of them out that I normally show because we only have so much time. Uh, this is from my first real Islamic debate with Imam Shamsi, oh, not Shamsi, Shamsi Ali, Imam Shabir Ali at Biola University in uh, 2000, May of 2006. Now this was uh, Shabir and I's first debate. We have debated a number of times since then. We debated in the uh, mosque in Toronto uh, just this past year. And we're just about to start writing together one of the most unusual books you'll ever see, a co-authored book between a Muslim and a Christian on the key issues that separate us, the Trinity and Tawhid. So uh, pray for that project as, uh, as, it, uh, as it begins. But this was from our first in exchange. Please notice Shabir is not reading any notes, and uh, he takes a little bit of a different perspective than the other guy did. The level on this is fairly low, so you'll probably have to crank it up. Is there any way that you can give to us this evening to explain to us uh, how we can determine what is still inspired in the New Testament and what is not? Well, I believe that uh, Muslims have a simple answer to this in saying that whatever is in the Quran, uh, that would be a 
a judge of whatever is there in, in the Bible. So whatever of the Bible agrees with the Quran, that obviously is inspired. What uh, is contradictory is obviously not from God. And that which is neutral, and neither in agreement nor in disagreement, uh, may be treated with some bit of silence. Usually the classical scholars have recommended silence. But I believe that uh, Muslims who are quite familiar with the Gospels and uh, familiar with the development of, of the text over time can make some judgments, uh, though these judgments will be tentative. So everything about the cross, resurrection, atonement, deity of Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy Spirit is a divine person, not an angel, Gabriel, all of that stuff is, is uninspired and, and a corruption of the original intention of the New Testament in light of the Quran. A Muslim would say that uh, the Quranic revelation is here now as the pristine word of God that teaches us that there is only one God, that Jesus is his uh, Messiah, but nevertheless a servant, a messenger of the one true God. And so anything that is contrary to that, something that teaches, for example, uh, that human responsibility as described in the Quran is to be somehow evaded, um, that, that would be contrary and would be thought to be a later development. Now, of course, that could be studied from another angle. One can look at the history and development of Christian teaching over time. One can look at the Gospels, uh, even without Islamic presuppositions. And it seems to me that uh, many uh, biblical scholars are coming to conclusions which are very close to the main conclusions which uh, Muslims insist on, that Jesus was uh, an apocalyptic uh, prophet, like the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, he preached uh, the belief in God, similar to the belief in the, uh, that was known uh, from the Jewish prophet, since he himself was Jewish, he lived in a Jewish milieu. You mean people like the Jesus seminar, uh, John Dominic Cross and Marcus Borg. Uh, it doesn't have to be them. The scholars are so numerous, it'll be hard for us to list them and, and to, to name them now. So, uh, is there is there any uh, is there any New Testament book uh, that Mark, for example, which you've referred to many times, Mark clearly identifies Jesus as the Son of God, puts words in his mouth that you would never be able to accept as a Muslim. Isn't that correct? Well, it is clear that even Mark uh, must have um, uh, suffered from a similar sort of phenomenon that we uh, described with in the case of Matthew. Mm -hmm. And John Bowden has made specifically that point in his book, Jesus, The Unanswered Questions. If we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, which in many Bibles begins the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is noted in the NIV, for example, that the title, the Son of God, in this particular verse, uh, is not found in some of the most ancient and reliable manuscripts. So I'm not saying that the Gospel according to Mark does not present Jesus as the Son of God, but we have to be aware of scribal changes that have affected the Gospel according to Mark in places as well. And uh, in fact, we are working with the Gospel according to Mark only as it has come down to us. Knowing the history of scribal changes, uh, we would not be out of our grounds to wonder if in fact we do really have the original Mark and Gospel. Would you admit that you do not have any uh, hard manuscript evidence from the first or second centuries that gives to us a New Testament that looks like a Muslim would expect it to look like? We do not have such a document. Now, obviously, Shabir has done a little more study. Uh, and uh, in my experience, you will more often encounter the fig tree uh, type of Muslim than the Shabir Ali type of Muslim, but again, it, it all depends. There's obviously an entire spectrum in between as to the level of knowledge they have concerning, uh, you know, most Muslims have not memorized Mark 1.1, 1, 1, and note there's a textual variant noted in the Mark in the NIV. All right, that's, you know, this is, this is what Shabir does. This is his job. Uh, but still, my point is, make sure that you are aware of the fact that there is that kind of, uh, of difference uh, between, uh, between the folks. We've already seen the five pillars. Let's take a look at the six articles of belief of Sunni Islam. I cannot this evening even really begin to enumerate any of the differences between the Sunni and the Shia. Uh, I will just mention that Sunni makes up about 90% of the world's Muslims, the Shiites about 10%. There's actually a few other groups thrown in there for good measure. Uh, the reason we hear more about the Shiites recently is they sit on about 50% of the oil reserves that Muslims control. And so they have somewhat of a uh, higher uh, political uh, clout than they would otherwise, and of course, the Shiites are predominant in uh, Iran, and therefore those issues come up there. We'll be talking primarily about Sunni Islam because of the fact that most of the time you're going to be encountering someone who is Sunni. These six articles of belief are belief in Allah, of course, belief in all the prophets and messengers. There have been uh, over 100,000 of them. Uh, God <laughs> has sent prophets and messengers to every people. 
Uh, from the Islamic perspective, you need to understand that uh, Abraham was a Muslim and, and uh, because he submitted to God, Jesus was a Muslim, the disciples were Muslims. Uh, Islam is the original religion from which all the rest of us are departures or defections. In fact, from the Islamic perspective, you're all born as a Muslim. And then your parents, per virtue, turn you into an atheist, a Christian, a Jew, something along those lines. But you're born uh, on the fitrah, you're born as a Muslim. Belief in angels and jinn, yes, believe it or not, uh, genie is an Islamic um, aspect of things. The jinn, uh, I didn't know this uh, until I started listening to a, a, a 16 CD set from a, a man that I've had some correspondence with, I really respect him a lot, named uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. And uh, listening to his discussion of the world of the jinn was fascinating. The jinn are made of smokeless fire. Uh, they are stronger than humans, faster than humans, but not as smart as humans. Put that combination together, it could be very dangerous. Sounds like a teenager in a Camaro. Um, <laughs> stronger, faster, but not as smart. That's, that's not a good combination at all. And, uh, uh, but uh, that's where the story comes from in regards to uh, genie and, the, and, the, and the, the smoke and so on and so forth. Um, anyways, uh, belief in the books, the kitavim, plural, sent by God, which includes the Torah and the Injil, the law and the gospel. Belief in the day of judgment, uh, which certainly includes hellfire. There are more dis there's more discussion of hellfire in the Quran and certainly in the Hadith than um, uh, found in uh, anywhere in the Bible for that matter. Uh, and belief in destiny, Qadr, uh, which is a basically, the, from the Islamic perspective, on the 40th day of, uh, after uh, the creation of your life in the, in the womb, an angel comes and writes for you what your life is going to be like, what you're going to do, whether you're going to heaven or hell, uh, all these facts of your life, including the day of your death. And it is all basically stamped on your forehead at that particular point in time. Uh, and the difference between that and the belief in predestination is that Allah is completely aloof. He is not involved in... Uh, the, the actual uh, outworking of these things, certainly not in the Christian sense, which includes such things as the incarnation of the Son and things like that. So these are the six articles of belief. Now, there are no creeds in Islam in the sense of a Nicene Creed or a, a, a Apostles' Creed or something like that. About as close as you get is Surah 112. Now let me just briefly introduce you to the concept of the Quran once again. Since you haven't read it, the Quran is about 57% the length of the New Testament. So it's not a, a huge book. If you ever choose to read it, and I would not discourage you from doing so, if you ever choose to read it, uh, I would suggest that one of the first things you do is that you go to my blog and you look up the word chronological. If you do that, uh, it will bring you to a blog entry where I have put a, a chart, and I have a book coming out in April with Bethany House called What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. The same chart will be in there as well, so that would be one way of doing it. But um, I've put a chart there that gives the best guess that we can give as to the chronological order in which the surahs of the Quran were written. If you remember after 9-11, uh, reporters from CNN and all these other news networks are running off to Barnes & Noble and they're... They're standing there thumbing through Qurans, trying to find something to read that would be somewhat relevant uh, to the subject, and they couldn't find anything. Uh, the reason is, if you just try to sit down and read the Quran, it's not going to make any sense to you, even in a decent English translation. And that's because as you, it is made up of 114 surahs, which is roughly equivalent to a book, even though the shortest surahs are only a few verses long. Um, and then you have verses which are called ayah, the ayat of the, of the Quran. And so you have 114, and if you start reading at the first, Surat al-Fatiha, uh, that's the opening. It's a seven-verse uh, That's the opening. It's a seven-verse opening prayer. Then you have Surat al-Baqarah, which is the Surah of the Cow. It's hundreds of verses long. And then Surah 3 is a little bit shorter, and Surah 4 is a little bit shorter. It's all based on how large the Surah is. So as you're reading it, you're jumping back and forth, back and forth between different periods in Muhammad's life. And so even if you know Muhammad's life, which most of us do not, um, there's just no, there's no context. There's no way to follow along and make heads or tails out of what in the world is being said. Even if you read it chronologically, 
it is good to maybe get a study version. There are some of them out there. Uh, a journey through the Quran, for example, is once available on Amazon that at least gives you historical background. It tells you what the background of certain verses are because even within a long surah, there are some verses that are from one incident in Muhammad's life and some that are from another incident at a different time. And sometimes what's here comes actually after what comes later. And it's just, it's next to impossible to follow the Quran in a meaningful fashion uh, in that way. Uh, and so if you're going to read it, and obviously it's, if you, if you want to talk to a Muslim, it's good to have some familiarity with the teachings of the Quran, uh, then do so in, in a way that at least your time will be spent in a, in a meaningful fashion. Now, as you can see, Surah 112 is toward the very end. If there's only 114 surahs, then, and you have all of it in front of you. And it says, say he is Allah, the one and only, Allah, the eternal absolute, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. Only four ayah, four verses. And Muhammad himself said in a couple of the hadith, hadith, by the way, are a collection of sayings of the sayings, actions of uh, the Prophet Muhammad and his companions. Uh, there are, are six what are called Sahih or sound collections. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, for example, is nine volumes uh, long. Uh, I just finished reading it uh, yesterday, yay! Um, and uh, uh, now I've got only five more sets to go. And um, uh, these, these really become the mechanism whereby you interpret the Quran. And in the Hadith, Muhammad said that to quote Surah Ali Klaas, Surah 112, is to quote one-third of the Quran. So it's worthy of uh, having quoted one-third of the Quran. So it obviously was one of the most important of the texts of the Quran. Now notice that two, uh, the three of the four verses, we really wouldn't have any problem with. Allah is the one and only, Allah the eternal absolute, there is none like unto him, sounds like something from Isaiah or Jeremiah, doesn't it? But notice that the third ayah says, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten. And I gave you the Arabic there, lam yelid wa lam yulid. Yelid is the same root. Arabic is a Semitic language, just as Hebrew is. And if you're familiar with the Hebrew language at all, you know that, for example, we just went through the Christmas season, and most of us heard Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born. The Hebrew root is yalad. A yelid was, was yaladed to us. Same root. And I have taken, for example, some of the classes I've taught, and I've gone over to the mosque at ASU, and... We've had dialogues with the imam there, and I remember asking him, uh, the third ayah of Surat al Ikhlas, then Yelid wa lam do you believe that that is specifically in reference to Christians and to their assertion that Jesus is the Son of God? And he said, oh, there's no question about it. Now, if it is the case that one of the most important surahs in all the Quran, and the Quran, of course, comes 600 years after the completion of the New Testament, uh, Muhammad dies in 632. If, uh, if one of the most important surahs in the Quran, one quarter of it is a negation of, a denial of, the central aspect of our assertion that Jesus is the Son of God, this has something to do with how the two religions relate to one another. And as you'll see, though we won't have time to go into very many of them, uh, there are actually numerous references in the Quran to you and I. We are addressed by name in the Quran. We are called the Al Kitab, the people of the book. We're also specifically, you and I are called the Al Al Injil, the people of the gospel, a couple of times in the Quran as well. And uh, we'll look at what a couple of those have to say. Now, what Surat Ali Klaas t is teaching is the central aspect of Islamic theology, and that is the concept of Tawheed. Tawheed means the oneness of God, oneness as in Unitarianism. They believe we, many of them, not all, but many of them believe we are tri-theists, that we believe in three different gods. And that is one of the major uh, differences between us and stumbling blocks in the presentation of the gospel. One of the key issues in the presentation of the gospel is the subject of shirk. Shirk, S-H-I-R-K. It is the one unforgivable sin in Islam. The one unforgivable sin in Islam is shirk. Now, shirk in, uh, in standard everyday Arabic refers to it like an association or a corporation. But in religious meaning, shirk is to associate anything with Allah in worship. And so that is the greatest sin. In fact, it is the only 
unforgivable sin. If you die as a mushrik, uh, a mushrik is a person who commits shirk, just, a, just as a mu, mu, uh, uh, mujahideen is a person who commits jihad, etc., etc. Uh, if you die as a mushrik on the sin of shirk, then you cannot be forgiven. Allah can forgive any other sin except for that one sin. So this is one of the major hurdles that you have to get over in dealing with witnessing to Muslims, is that the Muslim believes you are inviting them to commit shirk. They believe you're committing, you, not only are you committing it, but that you are inviting them to commit the one sin that if they go ahead and do that, then walk out the door and get hit by an asteroid, uh, they're not going to be able to be forgiven. That's it. That's a huge, huge thing. In fact, so much so that in the Hadith, once again, uh, Muhammad tells the story that every prophet is given uh, one intercession for his people. But Muhammad was given a, a second intercession. Um, his main intercession is going to be on the Day of Judgment when he releases all of his people who have said La ilaha illallah from the hellfire. Uh, but the uh, minor intercession he was given is that even though the Quran commands Muhammad to not pray for even his own parents who died as mushrikeen, he could not even pray for his own parents. But there was one man, his uncle Abu Talib. Uh, when Muhammad first began his prophetic ministry, according to the Islamic sources in Mecca in 610 AD, um, he was not really well appreciated. The, the, his tribe, the Quraysh tribe, got most of its money from the trade of people coming in to worship at the Kaaba where all the idols were. And so now one of their own people is preaching against the Kaaba. So that doesn't make people very happy and so he's being mistreated. But he is protected in that society by one man, his uncle, Abu Talib. For a number of years this takes place and finally Abu Talib was lying on his deathbed and Muhammad came in and he, he was encouraging him to say La ilaha illallah and if he would, then he would intercede with Allah for him, and so on and so forth. But the rest of the family members are saying, do not abandon the, 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 the religion of your ancestors. And, and he died without having said, la ilaha illallah. And so Muhammad was given one exception. He was allowed to intercede for Abu Talib. And what was the result of Muhammad's intercession for Abu Talib? According to the Hadith, Abu Talib has the best place in hell. He has the best place in hell. The place of least punishment. And you know what the least punishment in hell is? He's wearing sandals that are so hot, his brains boil. That's the least punishment in the hellfire. And that's how serious shirk is. That even though Muhammad himself intercedes for you, all that results in is you get the garden spot of hell. So shirk is extremely important. So we see in Surah 3113, O oh my son, join not and worship others with Allah, for false worship is indeed the highest wrongdoing. And Surah 61, Praise be Allah, who created the heavens and the earth, and made the darkness and the light. Yet those who reject faith hold others as equal with their guardian Lord. Now there are entire sections, and I'm going to look really quickly here to see if I have them down below, uh, or if I do not. And... Uh, wanted to at least, yeah, I do have it down below, so I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and go down to that. That'll, that'll be helpful. Now, so what did I say the, the first barrier is? The first barrier is they believe that you are calling them to shirk. The second barrier is this, and I have <laughs> 10 minutes before we take uh, questions, maybe a little bit longer than that. I'll, I'll go a little bit farther. <clears throat> the second barrier is that the Quran denies that Jesus died upon a cross. Now, the Quran does say a lot about Jesus. Uh, the name Isa appears in the Quran 25 times. There are about 93 verses or so that make some reference to Jesus. He's called the Messiah. He's born of a virgin. There's an entire surah, surah 19 in the Quran, that is named after his mother Mary. She is the only woman named by name in the Quran. Jesus, according to the Quran, may, did perform miracles that we don't believe he performed. Yes, he raised the dead and, and, and fed people and so on and so forth, but the Quran says that Jesus formed clay birds 
and then breathed on them, and they became alive and flew away. Sound familiar to anyone? That actually comes from the Gnostic uh, infancy gospel of Thomas. The infancy gospel of Thomas. And so there are a number of sources, a number of Gnostic sources, where various stories appear in the Quran itself. And the author of the Quran shows absolutely no critical knowledge whatsoever of the difference between canonical Gospels and non-canonical Gospels. In fact, the author seems to know more about the Gnostic Gospels than he does Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Which raises some major issues as to the accuracy of the Qadar's representation of Christian belief and things along those lines. We won't go into that. But, in all the Qadar, there is one ayah, one verse, that denies the crucifixion. There are other verses that if you reread them, without this in the Quran, would seemingly make reference to the death of Christ. Surah 355, Surah 1933. But we have Surah 4, 157, and as a result, every Muslim you're going to talk to does not believe that Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross under Pontius Pilate. Or you have one small group called the Ahmadi Muslims who do believe he was crucified, but he didn't die. He actually survived, sort of the old swoon theory thing, and got out of the tomb went to India. I'm not sure why everybody goes to India when that happens, but that's, uh, that's what happened. <laughs> so, Surah 4, 1 to 7, that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them, and those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for of a surety... They killed him not. In the very next verse, verse 158 says, Nay, Allah raised him up, Rafahu unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power and wise. So there it is, one verse. Now what does this verse mean? The Quran claims to be mubinun. Mubinun means clear, perspicuous, easy to understand. Well, let me tell you something. I have sat with my Arabic tutor, a dear brother from uh, Syria, whose, uh, whose family is in grave danger this evening. I would appreciate your prayers for them. Uh, his uh, father has had a rocket explode in his backyard. And uh, um, I don't know why they call this the Arab Spring, but uh, you could live in Syria under Assad as a Christian. You won't be able to live in Syria under the is Islamists who are taking over. I can assure you of that. There are already many who are losing their lives as martyrs in that, in that nation, even as we speak, for their Christian faith. But I have sat with uh, my Arabic tutor, his name is Assam, and we have translated this text many times. And I have asked him over and over, could we take it this way? Oh, maybe, would it, would it be possible that it means this? Uh, how about this? We have looked at this in every different way. And there's one thing I can tell you, even in Arabic, this is not Mubinun. This is not clear. This is not perspicuous. For example, this is talking about the Jews. The Jews said we killed Messiah Jesus. The Jews are going to call Jesus Messiah? Doesn't make much sense. But then it says they killed him not. Well, is that just talking about the Jews? Or is it talking about the Romans too? It doesn't say. Why does it say they killed him not nor crucified him? Crucifixion normally resulted in death. Um, and in fact, in all of recorded history, we know of one person who received a partial crucifixion who survived. Only one. Everybody else, generally, that meant the end. The Romans were very good executioners. They, they were very, very skilled at what they did. So why does it say, did not kill him nor crucified him? But the most important phrase is, but so it was made to appear to them. Shubi halahum. Should be halal. What does that mean? Well, the majority of the Muslims outside of Western cultures, which would mean the majority of Muslims, believe in what's called the substitution theory. They believe someone else was put on the cross in Jesus' place. Someone else was made to look like Jesus and was nailed to the cross. Now, who would be the best candidate for that? Judas. Right. So most Muslims believe that Judas was placed upon the cross and Jesus was taken up to heaven. Because 
I've talked with missionaries who have been walking through a, a street somewhere in, in Africa, in a, in a village, in, amongst huts, and people come out and talk to them, and here will be these people, and they've never been exposed to Western culture or anything, but they'll go, I just don't understand how you Christians could believe that Allah would allow one of his beloved prophets to die in such a horrible way. I just don't understand why you believe that. And they've never had anyone explain to them that Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I give it of my own accord. We have to emphasize the voluntary nature, the self-giving of Christ. Because they believe that to die in that way is just a humiliating thing and the law would never allow it to happen to one of his great prophets. And so, some I had one, I had one Muslim send me a long message once of proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was Simon the Cyrene who was nailed to the cross of Calvary. Just proving it beyond all shadow of a doubt. I know, I know, notice I said mostly that is the case amongst those in non-Western uh, uh, societies. In the West, my Muslim friends tend to say, Allahu alam, God knows. Why? Because they've sort of recognized there's a little bit of a problem with the substitution theory. If you accept substitution theory that's God who made somebody look like Jesus, then Allah started Christianity by mistake. And since Christianity is one of the biggest origins of shirk in the universe, then Allah started all these acts of shirk and all these people worshiping Jesus, and he did it because he just deceived everyone so well. That doesn't sound real good. And so a lot of folks have sort of backed off from that and said, we, we don't know. It doesn't say, should be halaham, might mean that, but... It just simply means that Jesus wasn't crucified. What happened, only Allah really knows. And so you'll frequently have people sort of back off from that. And you'll notice that, for example, uh, Yusuf Ali in his translation says, the Orthodox Christian churches make it a cardinal point of their doctrine that his life was taken on the cross, that he died and was buried, and on the third day he rose and the body of his wounds attack, uh, intact, and walked about and conversed and ate with his disciples and was afterward taken up bodily to heaven, this is necessary for the theological doctrine of blood sacrifice and vicarious atonement for sins, which is rejected by Islam. And so they reject the concept that there needs to be any atonement for the forgiveness of sins. And since that is the case, there is no need for Christ to have died. Obviously, if there was no crucifixion, then there was no resurrection either, and the entirety of that story is false. And therefore, from the Islamic perspective... The gospel itself is truly foolishness and it has no historical basis whatsoever. If you'd like to see a debate uh, that we just did on this, I was in London a few months ago, I debated a man by the name of Sami Zatari on the subject of uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. That is available on YouTube if you would like to take a look at that. Now, a couple of other texts uh, that I think are very important if you're going to uh, be taking some notes. Uh, I want to present to you what I call the Islamic Dilemma. Um, in Surah 5, and yes, this is all contained in the book, which isn't here this evening, but hopefully will be once I get done indexing it. But anyways, um, you can pray that I uh, get that work done hopefully next week. But in Surah 5, we read these words, And we sent, following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah. And we gave him the gospel, which was guidance and light, and confirming that which proceeded of the Torah as guidance and instruction for the righteous. So what's being said? Well, uh, the Torah was sent down to Moses. Then we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, and he confirmed that which came before him in the Torah. And we gave him the Injil, the gospel, in which was guidance and light, so it's divine in nature. And it confirmed that which preceded it of the Torah as guidance and instruction for the righteous. Those are pretty positive words. The, the Quran views itself as a continuation. You have the, the Torah, you have the Injil, you have the Quran. Then we have a command. And wouldn't you like to know what you're commanded to do in the Quran? Here is one of the more important ones in my opinion, Surah 547. And let the Alal Injil, the people of the Gospel. See, sometimes people of the book can be Jews or Jews and Christians. But Allah and Jeel, that's us. We're the, that's Christians only. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. 
And whoever does not judge by the law has revealed that it is, it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. Now, again, I have asked, uh, I've looked at the Arabic rather closely. I've asked my tutor uh, to, to verify this. And there can be no question when it says by what Allah has revealed therein, the therein is in reference to the gospel. So you and I are commanded to judge by what's in the gospel. Judge what? Well, you could make an argument. This is just talking about judge amongst ourselves and the disputes we have in our own communities. That is a possibility. But it's also possible, and I've had a number of Muslims agree with this, that it's actually talking about judging what Muhammad was saying. That Muhammad was inviting us to judge by what's in the gospel. That the author actually believed that what he was saying was consistent with what was already in our own scriptures. Now, when I do that, I find the Quran to be very inconsistent with the New Testament. When I obey Surah 547, I have to reject the Quran. But here's the other thing. As soon as you start talking about the Bible with Muslims today, they'll say, well, but it's been changed so often. It's been corrupted. They, they love Bart Ehrman and all the critics of the Bible that are out there today. I mean, almost every Muslim I debate has Bart Ehrman books on his, on his table. I just think, that, think that's great. And pretty soon we should be putting up uh, a, a video of the two debates that I did in London at the same time with a man by the name of Adnan Rashid, where I defended the accuracy of the transmission of the text of the New Testament, and then the second debate dealt with the accuracy of the transmission of the Quran, which turned out to be one of the more warm debates we've had. Uh, not because of the temperature, I assure you. And, and you'll be able to see how all that works out. But the Muslim believes that what you and I have has been changed and altered. Well, there's a problem here. You see, we know exactly what the New Testament looked like in the days of Muhammad. We have entire copies of the New Testament that long predate Muhammad. There's no question that we know exactly what the gospel... If these words had any meaning when they were given sometime prior to 632 A.D., somewhere between 630 and, uh, 620 and 632 A.D., we know what the gospel was to the al al Jeel at that time. We know that. And we judge by that. So either the Muslim has to say, if they want to go with the, it's been corrupted, then these words never had any meaning because the people of the gospel can't judge by what's in the gospel because the gospel was lost by the time Muhammad came around. Or if they want to say, well, okay, they have to have meaning, and so therefore there had to have been uh, a gospel at that time, then we still have that gospel today. We judge by that, and the Quran's be rejected. Which one do you want? Either the Quran's wrong or the Quran's wrong. There's your choice. And uh, I have presented this dilemma in numerous debates with numerous very intelligent Islamic proponents, and they struggle with it. They struggle with it a lot. Now, so what are, what are the, what are the uh, problems that we have here? We have the problem with shirk. We have the problem with the cross. We have the Islamic dilemma here uh, for us, uh, an argument we can use. And the last thing is the Quran misrepresents what you and I believe. Now, even if the doctrine of the Trinity were not true, is it not a given that Allah knew what the doctrine of the Trinity was in 632 AD? I mean, the, you know, does God understand perfectly uh, Joseph Smith's teachings? Yeah, I think he understood Joseph Smith's teachings better than Joseph Smith did, uh, to be very honest with you, anybody else has since then. God knows even the falsehoods of men better than the men themselves. So even if the Trinity was wrong, there would be no reason for the Quran to misrepresent it because Allah would know what it really was. So if the Quran misrepresents the doctrine of the Trinity 600 years after the birth of Christ and over 300 years after the Council of Nicaea, then what does that tell us about the Quran? Its author is a human being, not God himself. Now, I don't have time to go through all of them. Normally, I develop this and give you all the background on the Quran. I just got to jump to the main verse so you can write it down and, and, and give it to you. But if you, were, if you were Muhammad and you lived in Mecca, and we know that he went on caravan trading. Mecca could only survive by caravan trading. I mean, it's not exactly the garden spot of the Middle East, okay? And so you have to bring food in and things like that. So if that were the case, then you go on caravan, you go up into Christian Syria, and you're a 15 or 16 year old guy, and you've got a little while before the caravan's moving out, what are you going to do? 
You're just going to sit next to the camels all day? I really don't think so. You're going to go exploring, aren't you? And what would Muhammad have seen if he had gone into a small Christian church in villages in Syria? Say around the year 590. 585, somewhere around there. What, what would he have seen? If he had stuck his head in, what would have been around? Well, there would have been a fair amount of artwork. There would have been statues. There would have been statues of God, maybe creating the universe. There would be crucifixes. Jesus on the cross. But uh, what would the Holy Spirit have been represented as? A dove? I wouldn't have exactly uh, suggested a uh, divine being to Muhammad. But what would he have seen a lot of? A woman. A woman. The exaltation of Mary had begun long before that. And so there would be a woman holding a baby. And then there's a man on a cross. Hmm. God. Woman. Baby. Hmm. The Quran says that when we attribute a son to God, he cannot have a son because he doesn't have a wife. He doesn't have a wife. And when we do, it's like attributing something to God that makes the mountains fall down. It's a terrible, horrible, horrible thing to do. But look at what we have in Surah 5, 116. Surah 5, 116. And beware the day when Allah will say, O oh, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? He will say, exalted are you, it was not for me to say, that to which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Surah 5, 116. So the day of judgment, Allah is going to say to Jesus, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? Remember I said that the man's fig tree argument was a Quranic argument? There is a text in Surah 4 that says, Allah makes his signs clear, yet they are so deceived. Jesus and his mother ate food. And yet, these people are deceived. The point is, if you eat food, you can't be God. And it mentions Mary eating food. So the author of the Quran thinks we believe Mary's what? God. And so you've got Allah, married to Mary. They have a kid named Jesus. And there's your trinity. This is the only place in the entire Quran where you have three mentioned. And the Quran says, say not three. The Quran never says, say not trinity. The word trinity is not appear in the Quran. It says, say not three. Three what? Three gods. Allah, another god named Mary, and then a god named Jesus. The author of the Quran did not understand what we believe. And if you would like to see a debate on that, <laughs> I debated the Psalm Zawadi in London a couple years ago at Trinity, at Trinity Road Chapel on that subject. And the fascinating thing was, by the end of that particular presentation... I was the one arguing that the Quran is consistent in Surah 5 in its teaching, and the Muslim was having to say the Quran is not consistent in Surah 5 on its teaching. <laughs> that was the only way to get around the fact that the Quran misrepresents the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, very quickly before we take some questions, let me explain why all of this is important. I'm just going to put that up there for a moment to introduce a question, a, a story. As I mentioned yesterday, I finished Sahih al-Bukhari. It is a huge, huge collection of stories. And, and what's tough about reading it is that the stories are repeated over and over and over again. Well, if I was reading it just sitting at a table, it would have been easy to skip the repeated stories. But since I had converted to MP3, I just had to listen to all of them. I've listened to some Hadith stories 30 and 40 times a piece. The same story. They're just repeated over and over again. It's great for memory, but uh, a couple times I wanted to ride off the road into a cactus to feel better. So... Um, <laughs> So, just remember, I read the bad books so you don't have to. Um, but this story is told about four or five times just in, in Bukhari alone. And the story is told by Muhammad of a man, a Jewish man, who had killed 99 people. Mass murderer. Mass murderer. 
And uh, he came to a, uh, a monk and asked him if his repentance would be accepted. And the monk said no, and so he killed the monk, so now he's killed 100 people. <laughs> and so then he went to a scholar, and he asked the scholar, can my repentance be accepted? I don't know if the scholar knew about the monk or not, but he came up with a different answer. He said, go to such and such a city, and the people there are very righteous, and they will instruct you as to what you must do for your repentance to be accepted. So as the man is going, the time of his death comes. Remember, the time of your death, the very moment of your death, written on your forehead on, uh, before you're even born. And so he dies, and when you die, an angel from the hellfire and an angel from paradise come, and they argue over your soul. Now, I don't know about you, but the guy from Hellfire should have had a fairly easy job on this one. All right? I mean, um, mass murderer, has not repented. Um, this one's easy. But the angel from Paradise uh, sounds like an ACLU lawyer. And he says, but he was going to find out about repentance. And so a law decrees that if he is one cubit closer to the city he was going to than the city he was coming from, he will go to paradise. And then he causes the earth to shrink between the man in that city until he's one cubit closer and he is ushered into paradise. Now, I am not cherry-picking this story. I had told this story for years. And then I was doing a radio program with Imam Shamsi Ali, the imam of the largest mosque in New York City, with whom I was about to do a debate. And he told the story as an illustration of the mercy of Allah. So this is a well-known story. It's not something being taken out of context. You would think, if that's the case, that every good Muslim has got it made. I mean, if you say your prayers five times a day, you go on hajj, you, you, you fast fastidiously during Ramadan, you should have your ticket punched and go into heaven. The problem is, Allah is about as arbitrary and unpredictable as Muhammad was. And there were companions of Muhammad himself who would break into tears at the thought of their death because they did not have assurance that they were going to come out of the hellfire. In fact, just for you ladies, I thought this one is repeated a number of times in the Hadith. <laughs> I was shown the hellfire and that the majority of its dwellers are women. <laughs> Not sure why that's there, but I just thought I would point that out to you. <laughs> Normally wakes people up a little bit toward the end of the presentation. <laughs> just a second. But um, the excuse, the reason is given is not one that we would find overly compelling because he was asked, why is that? And uh, the, the answer had to do with the fact that uh, women could not pray during their periods and that their uh, testimony is worth only half of that of a man, to which I think most Muslim women thought in their minds but did not speak with their mouths, yeah, but those are your rules. Um, but that was the answer that was given at that point in time. Why does all this matter? We close with this. June 30th, 2007. This is the Glasgow airport in Glasgow, Scotland. I have walked through it many times. Have you gone through that door, brother? Oh, I have too. The, the Starbucks is just down on the other side. You know, you know what I'm talking about? I, I've stood there waiting more than once for Brother Handy's side. I've checked in at those gates uh, as the people are running away. The fire is from a Jeep that has driven into the airport and has exploded in flames. Thankfully, um, the folks who created the bomb were not really good at creating bombs, and the only people who died in the attack were the guys in the car. And they died of their burns later. That's a not a good way to go in any way, shape, or form. But there you see the flames, you see the fire, and you think about two people who would pack a Jeep with all that gas and explosive devices and then hit the accelerator and head for that door, undoubtedly yelling Allahu Akbar as they then press the button to detonate the bomb hoping that a huge fireball would go in and consume all those people. And you ask the question, why does someone do that? Why does someone do that? And the answer normally given is, oh, you know, they're down and outers, and they got nothing else to live for, and 
And, you know, they, they're they being promised there are 70 virgins and things are so bad here, they might as well go do this. There's one little problem with that theory. The two men in the car, physicians, doctors, national health care doctors. Why would they do this? Well, because they were convinced that the only way that they could know that they had peace with Allah was to die in jihad. Now, I have Muslim friends who say what they did was not Islamic and it was wrong. And I wish an increase to their tribe because I do fly through the same airport. I wish an increase to their tribe. I understand their arguments. I could repeat their arguments. But the problem is the line that divides the radicalized Muslim and the non-radicalized Muslim not, is not only a very small line that is very worrisome to me, but the problem is the debate between these two sides is based upon sources that I am absolutely convinced are not consistent or clear enough to answer the question. And that's the problem. I mean, I've listened to these guys, and you can choose your hadith, and they choose their hadith, and they square off against one another, and well, your hadith isn't sound, well, your hadith isn't sound, well, there's an error in your narration, blah, 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 blah. And the problem is, this massive body of collected memories is simply not clear enough to answer the question. I wish it was. We'd have a safer, more peaceful world if it was. But it's not. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Theology matters. What happens here, folks? You have a holy God. You have hellfire. You have sinners. Well, we have a holy God, we have hellfire, and we're sinners. What's the difference? We have a mediator. We have a mediator that they have been denied. We have the God-man. We have the one, the only one, the unique one, where all the wrath and justice of God can meet all the love and mercy of God in the one unique place, called the cross of Calvary. And they have been denied that. And there's the result. Theology matters. Theology matters. So, what about you? What are you going to do? What can you do? Well, first of all, you can pray that God will remove from your heart fear in proclaiming the message of the gospel to Muslims. Fear of the unfamiliar, fear of retribution. You can pray, God, remove the fear from my heart, make me a bold witness. And of course, you can do more preparation. Because my little hour and 15 minutes, I've introduced you to some of the major issues, but that's all of them. The areas of discussion between us, Vitally important in all areas of apologetics. The transmission of the Bible, the accuracy of the transmission, the, the reliability of the text of Scripture, the doctrine of the Trinity, the atonement. All these things are things we deal with with every group. So your study in those areas is not just going to be about Islam. But there is a need to understand more about why Muslims believe the way they believe. And of course, as you have opportunity, then you pray that God's Spirit will use your words to bring light and life. Again, most of us have learned most of what we know from Fox News. That's not where we need to be. As Christians, I would think we would want to be able to look at our world and have some understanding, a biblical understanding, of why things are happening the way they are. I am quite concerned, my friends, that our governmental leaders do not understand Islam. They have a secular mindset. And they can understand why Muslims will do the things that Muslims will do. And I think we've already seen some of the results of that. One of the saddest things is, in every nation we've gone into, you know who's suffered the most? The Christians. Christians, there were two million Christians in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. There are less than half a million now. They've been driven out. We wouldn't protect them. Hussein did. Every hymnal in every church in Baghdad was printed by Saddam Hussein. Why? Because he was a good guy? No. He knew how to keep peace, though. 
And unfortunately, that's not what's happening now. And that's happening in Syria. The Coptic Christians in Egypt are suffering. It's a mess. We need to pray. Remember Hebrews 13, 3. That we are to remember those who are in chains as if we were bound together with them. Sun dedemenoi. Bound together with them. If they pray for us, we need to pray for them. Let's keep them in prayer. All right. Uh, looks like we have 10 minutes. And uh, the gentleman in the back uh, had a question earlier on. It depends on what you're asking. I'm not sure what the question is. From? From Turkey. Okay. I have a for, uh, former Muslim. Uh, right now I am not. And I want to tell a little bit about my story. But I find that the thing is a lot of religious Muslims. Hey, for many years you were a religious Muslim? Uh, I'm 17 years old. Uh-huh. But then when I started to read some uh, lesson classes, some word classes, I, uh, I realized something. Mm -hmm. And 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 just just to clarify for folks, that would not be your your mother tongue, yeah. right? Right. In regards to the same thing, because not the problem. Usually the problem becomes this. When we tell uh people, this becomes a justification. No, this is wrong Islam. How about this one? No, it's wrong. Right. This is the denigration. This is ignorance to Islam. But how about the primary sources of it? And there's even more than it. Oh believe me, uh, this was very, very brief. I had to be I only had a very small amount of time. The the actual presentation is about three hours long and has a whole lot more Quran in it, especially from Surah Al-Maida, uh, Surah Al-Nisa, uh, Surah 4, 171, uh, 570, 172, all those texts I do include in those. So if you just had one or two, if you could explain what, what, you're, what you think the significance of those texts are, then we can get to it. Excuse me, um, first of all, because of my accent, actually, yes, still I speak in an accent, and I think this is not, uh, these are not the most surprising ones. Another one, for example. Well, could you, could you give me the reference? Yeah, Tawbah Surah, fifth verse. Okay, the... Yeah. When the sacred months have passed, then kill the polypaste. Actually, it's not polypaste, because in Arabic it is uh, the mushriks. Which... Like uh, you explain. Surah number? Uh, Tawbah Surah... Tawbah is nine? Surah Tawbah? Yeah, Taba. Yeah, Taba and, and what? Fifth. Okay. Yeah. When the sacred month, uh, sacred months have passed, then kill the polities wherever you find them, and capture them and besiege them, and sit in wait for them at every place of ambush. But if they should repent, establish prayer and give zakah, let them go on their way. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Yeah. Yes. And you'll notice that. Uh, the, uh, the term is mushrikim, is yeah. the term is used. Not polytheist. Well, polytheist, uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, it doesn't refer, because why? They know that uh, this is something to be, uh, to be condemned for today. Because what they want to show Islam is, Islam is peaceful, is tolerant. Yeah, but this is the tolerant. How about, sir, is this? How about sir, the top of verse 29? Yeah, 29 is here. Yeah, I can, I can read I've got, I've got it on the yeah, screen. Yeah, right, right. Fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day, and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful, <laughs> and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scripture. That's us, from amongst the al-kitab. 
fight until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. And the term while they are humbled there in Arabic is the same root that is used elsewhere in the Quran when Iblis is, is Iblis who is Satan is in encounter with Allah and Allah casts him out and says you are humiliated. And so the people of the book who against whom are to be fought are to be made to feel humiliated, not just humbled, but humiliated in the same way that Satan himself was by God. When And you know why Satan was cast out? Because he refused to bow down before Adam. Allah commanded all the angels to bow before Adam. Iblis would not, and so he was cast out and made to feel humiliated. The same term that is used of us, who are supposed to play, pay the jizya, the, uh, the, the tax, and to feel humiliated. This is, this is Surah Al-Taba, Surah 9 is the last of the surahs to be given. And the problem is, you can find in Surah 2, there is to be no compulsion in religion. Well, how do you put these two together? Well, Muslims have, uh, have adopted the concept of abrogation. The later revelations abrogate earlier revelations. And so since Surah Al-Taba is the last of the surahs to be given, then it has the highest authority and cannot be abrogated by something that comes after uh, very, very quickly. Yes, yeah, sir. very quickly. Yeah. Uh, when they say that this is not a real Islam, this is violence, just it's ignorance to real Islam. Actually, what I think is different. I think, fortunately, they don't know what real Islam is. Fortunately, they are living uh, it quite superficially. Because, fortunately, if I say the same verses in my country, which they say that 99% of it is Muslim, I am sure that the vast majority of it, of it will condemn me. No, it's violence, there is no way to do it. And when I show this, uh, these verses, they are quite shocked too. Well, well, let me just ask you a, a real quick question, because we've got a lot of others who want to ask questions. Let me just ask you a quick question. You say you started reading these in your own language, in your own language. so up until that point, you really had not been reading the Quran or the Hadith or anything like that in your own language? You were just going through the saying the prayers in, in Arabic, you weren't aware of these things? Yeah, prayer in Arabic, and just listen to the imams, the right. teachers, right. Yeah, in the government, just the, the Christian, they, uh, I mean, the religion they want to teach. Right. And the vast majority of it is like this, because there isn't such a habit to read it in their own language. Wow. And the problem is different than this, actually, I mean, because all these radical Islamic groups are relying on these verses, not something else. Right. And I don't know, what's the way to rebut it? What's the way to... Uh, well, I'll be perfectly honest with you, my friend. The only way to bring peace in this situation is for the Spirit of God to change people's hearts <coughs> so that they come to know who Jesus Christ is. That's the only way to, to deal with this. I do not believe that you can argue against what you're saying here. I, I, I know what the moderates say here. They're saying this is only about a certain, uh, certain groups of of the polytheists and only those that were opposing Islam and things like that. I understand that. The problem is I can go to the Hadith myself and find stories to back up the other interpretation of this, of this Quranic verse. That's one of the major differences between the Quran and the Bible. In the Bible we have background and context that allows us to say this is the actual interpretation of this text. The Quran is not, is not that way and that leads to the problem. Yeah, but then another, another contradiction comes. Uh, if it's something an ordinary man can understand it, why do I need, I mean, some scholars, a lot of scholars, hadith, just, I mean, beating around the bush for hours and hours. I know, I know, I know. I know. Thank you very much for yeah. sharing with us. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. Sure. Thank you. Okay, who's going who's gonna to be choosing uh, from all the hands here? I'm, I'm going to have to, all right, uh, he's waving at me, so you're close, and we got one over here, so. Just... Uh, real quick, you mentioned this presentation typically is about three hours. Is where would it be available if we wanted to? See um, I think yes, 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 yes. Uh, look up Islam A to Z on YouTube. I did a two-night, three-hour presentation at a church in Slidell, Louisiana, and all of this would be on that. With uh, with more of uh, more of the information, and then just real quickly, if there's somewhere you could reference, you know, where would be a good starting point? Uh, uh, you mentioned your book coming out, mm -hmm. but where else would be a good starting point for us to to start, you know, gaining information at an entry level so that we can better understand Islam and and how to begin interacting? What would you recommend to read? Well, 
It's just distracted because someone's sitting down here and then they leave and I'm hearing beep, 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 beep as they're leaving. I'm like, oh, good, yeah. <laughs> All righty, Lord, we're coming home. <laughs> It reminded me a little bit in the middle of the Hamza Abdul Malik debate, right while I was giving my opening presentation, all the Muslims in the room got up and left and left their backpacks on the seat. I'm like, okay, Lord. I knew there was a reason I didn't want to get into this, so here we go. Um, uh, Until the book comes out, (laughs) uh, it's not that there aren't other good books. Uh, uh, R.C. Sproul has a book out with Abdul Salib. There is a book called uh, Understanding the Quran, K-O-R-A-N. It's different than the spelling I use. Uh, from Zondervan by Mateen Elas, uh, which is one that I have, have utilized. But one thing that, that a lot of folks here in the audience that, that follow the dividing line know, obviously I address a lot of this stuff on the dividing line on my website, so you can uh, get all – I mean, uh, even when I'm not doing the debate, I will play other people's debates, and I will interact, interact with the Muslims and things like that there. Uh, but on our YouTube channel, I've got 580 videos, and not all of them are debates. Some of them are shorter sections where I'm dealing with particular elements of Islamic theology that uh, uh, can, you know, be even less than 10 minutes long or something like that. So there's a lot of a lot of material there. A lot of material there. Yes, sir. Hey, you're you're one of the you're one of the uh, yeah, you 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 can say say all you want. Yes, sir. We've got we've got. There we go. uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wondered, James. You know. Like, for instance, if you're interacting with the Jehovah's Witness and you're just going to share with them the gospel, right? You know that the gospel is powerful. The Lord can do whatever he wants. He can change a person like that. But you also know that there are certain barriers that they're just immediately going to have answers for. And so you may want to start a few steps back yes. and enter in at a certain place yes. in order to really have a meaningful dialogue with them. Is there something like that that you could say with uh, evangelizing to Muslims a place where you could start or where you would suggest to start? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I, I hesitate to, to, to say go to a certain place all the time because, for example, the uh, conversations I had uh, with some Muslims recently while I was traveling, one was the, the cab driver and the other was the shoeshine guy. And so it started at completely different places. What I can say is be aware of the barriers, and hence, if you know where you want to go, then be aware of what, what mountains you're going to have to climb to get to where you want to go. Where you want to go is not to have a lengthy discussion about Muhammad. You do not want to talk about Aisha. Uh, if anybody knows, Dave, how many of you know what Aisha? Aisha is Muhammad's child bride, uh, which, by the way, was not unusual in that day and is pretty much a dead end if you want to even try to go down that direction. Um, and interestingly enough, even the, the, the Quran does not show any embarrassment about the fact that Muhammad, at a, as a 50-year-old man, married a 6-year-old girl and then consummated the marriage at 9. That was not unusual in the culture. What the Quran does show extreme embarrassment about is when Muhammad married Zainab bin Jash, because Zainab bin Jash was the divorced wife of his adopted son. That requires an entire section of the Quran to undo the taboo which he had just violated. So that's actually much more of an interesting apologetic approach if you can go that direction. But if you don't know all the background, don't go there. Don't get involved in blind alleys, and especially ones that create a tremendous amount of emotional um, baggage to, to, to deal with. You want to, get to make, you want to make sure they understand the self-giving nature of the atonement. You want to make sure they understand that by grace you do not mean you have a license to sin, And you want to make sure that they understand that you are not inviting them to commit shirk. All right? Now, that's a tall order. Those are three big things, but you need to get in mind. I need to get to at least one of them. I want to try to get to at least one of them. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will bring somebody else along to do the rest. But uh, I was was speaking on this up in uh, Boulder uh, this past June, and I had a Muslim come up. And he was very thankful for the accuracy of the presentation and all the rest of that stuff. But I was just shocked the second night he was there. It, was, it so bothered me because he said, well, I just got to ask you one question. Why do you Christians, it, this, does, this doesn't seem to make any sense what you've been saying, but why do you Christians say that you can believe in Jesus and then you can commit any sin you want? That's what he had been taught Christians believe. Now, sadly, there are some Christians who claim that. You know, no repentance, do what you want. As long as you tip your hat to God, you're saved. Um, 
but he really had the idea. Serious engineer, not not a, not a stupid person, a very intelligent man. But he really thought, and he he could tell there was a big disconnect between that and what I had been saying. And so I had the opportunity to explain that to him. But uh, you've you've got to in any witnessing encounter you. Before you start, you've got to say, my goal is to get there. Because whatever things are thrown in your way, it's sort of like I've got to drive back to Viejo tonight, okay? If I run into road blockages or something, I'm going to have to go a different direction, and my GPS is going to have to route another way around. But it's always going to be going the same direction, trying to get me to the same place. If you don't have a goal going into a witnessing encounter, guess what? You'll never get there. You know, if I just get in my car and start driving tonight, I may have fun. But I'm not going to get anywhere. And that's what most, most Christians do when they get into witnessing situations. Well, I'm going to witness now. What are you going to try to tell them? Don't know. But I'll have fun getting there, you know. And they, you know, people come to me, yeah, the more missionaries came by today. How'd it go? Well, I don't know. We talked about everything. And I, well, that's the problem. You didn't have a goal. You've got to have a goal and got to set those goals based on what you want to communicate to them. All right? Okay. One more. One more. I, I, just... just I see a gentleman back here. I appreciate the presentation. Could you encourage us as the people of God of a testimony of a Muslim coming to faith in Christ that you've witnessed from your your labors, maybe in a debate or someone you knew that came up after a presentation that you had an opportunity with? Well, normally in debates, uh, certainly the person I'm debating is normally a professional apologist uh, who is not going to be overly uh, uh, listening to what I'm saying, only seeking to try to respond to what I'm saying. But what I have seen uh, is, for example, a situation after the debate with Shabir Ali Uh, was made available and was in distribution. I was contacted by some folks in, uh, I believe it was Missouri, uh, who had been working with some international students, and they showed them that debate. And the one thing that had been keeping them from embracing the gospel was what they had been taught about the corruption of the New Testament. And so, ironically, by being able to clarify and defend the accuracy of the New Testament, that then gave the foundation for them to believe the message they had already heard, and they accepted Christ and were baptized. Um, And so it's that kind of thing that that I see as being the most um, important aspect of this. What I'm really trying to do, in fact, I was asked a question at dinner this, this evening, what do you see down the road? What do you want your legacy to be? What I want to do with the rest of my life is provide the best information I can especially to the persecuted church. That's what I love about YouTube. I mean, uh, when we start doing the YouTube channel, Google allows you to sort of see where your hits are coming from. And as soon as we started doing the YouTube channel, channel guess what foreign nation lit up on our, on our Google map that we had never had hits from before? Indonesia. And if you know what Indonesia is, it's the largest Muslim country in the world. And so um, it was just... just I couldn't go there and say the things that I say, but YouTube can, uh, which is why Pakistan wants to block most of that stuff, is because they realize that as well. I want to provide that kind of information because I'll never forget, uh, a number of years ago, well, a number of years ago, 2006, I think 2007, uh, I had the opportunity of going and recording a number of videos to be live translated into Farsi for satellite transmission into Iran. And um, the, the people that were, were sponsoring this said, you know, we've talked to the believers in Iran. And we said, what do you need? And what I, love, what I love and what should be a real kick in the pants to all of us in our leisurely lives in the United States, they didn't ask to be removed from persecution. They didn't ask that political pressure be placed upon Iran to stop doing this, that, or the other thing. They said, give us the information to defend our faith, to explain it not only to our children and our children's children, but to the people around us. Equip us. They didn't want to leave the persecution. They wanted to be better servants in the midst of the persecution. 
And so when I think of the opportunities we've already had to do that and the number of people that have come and the opportunities that are coming, pray that we'll continue having them. Uh, as I, you know, as I think of, of that young man in the East London Mosque, you're, you are more Muslim than most Muslims I know, he told me, because I knew the Hadith. He was listening to me. And I remember after I debated Adnan Rashid in London, I had a Muslim come up to me and said, I, I don't believe what you're saying yet, but this is the first time I've understood what you people are saying. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's important, and that's what, I'm, that's what we're trying to do. So I very much appreciate your attention. A tremendous uh, group this evening had a great turnout. And uh, aren't you all thankful that I did stop my Scottish accent and did the rest in a normal... <laughs>